right, in this video I'm going to be breaking down Fear Agent Volume 4. Volume 3, last volume, was set 10 years in the past and told us the story of the Anubis Conflict, the initial alien invasion of Earth. Now, Volume 2 was set in the current day, and in Volume 2 we ended on this cliffhanger where Heath Houston and Mara Esperanza are now on the moon base with the rest of humanity as humanity can no longer live on Earth as it has been infested with these feeder aliens. So now humanity has to figure out their next move. One option is going to the feeder's home planet and trying to find a predator for the feeders and capture it and bring it to Earth to get rid of the feeders. And option two is try to find a new home for humanity, a new planet for everyone to move to. So in this volume, volume four, we will be picking up the story there and we will see where humanity can go from here. Very exciting stuff. Let's dive into it now. Volume four of Fear Agent. Fear Agent, volume four, Hatchet Job, written by Rick Remender, art by Jerome Opinia and Kieran Dwyer. Issue 17, Hatchet Job, chapter one. Picking up where we left off in Volume 2, Heath, Charlotte, and the new fear agents have now traveled 300,000 light years from Earth. They are in a place called the Deep. They are going to split off into two teams on two separate missions to try and save humanity. Team 1 will be Heath, Keith, Betty, and George. They are going to be heading to the feeder's homeworld in search of a natural predator of the feeders with hopes of capturing that predator and bringing it to Earth to hopefully wipe out the feeders. It's a dangerous long shot, kind of a dumb plan and probably won't work, but they gotta try. Team 2 is led by Charlotte and Mara. Mara is on that team because of her knowledge of space travel. She will serve as a navigator. Some of the other fear agents on this team are Nicholas, a Russian, a woman named Rita, Scott, and some others. They are looking for an inhabitable world. That is their mission. They are going to go to various planets and see where they can potentially move the humans on Earth to. There is a briefing where they all go over their mission objectives, and then everyone says their goodbyes and they split off. Team 1 is a go. Keith, Keith, Betty, and George have taken off in Heath's rocket ship, as well as a sister rocket ship, and the two ships are going their own way. Meanwhile, on Team 2, Charlotte, Scott, Rita, Nicholas, and Mara go look at various planets they can travel to as options. On their computer, they discuss a few planets they should maybe check out. Mara, she persuades everyone and eventually convinces them that certain planets they are looking at are too dangerous for whatever reasons. They are overcrowded with monsters or what have you. She instead points them towards a planet called Nevasivia. Charlotte gets convinced to go there and she gives her team the order to set coordinates for Nevasivia. Back to Team 1. They appear to be flying in two ships. Keith and Keith are in Heath's ship called the Alamo. This is the one with Annie as the AI. Betty and George and the others are in another bigger ship called the Eagle. Keith and Keith are talking there alone. Keith comments how dirty Heath's ship is. They fly on and they approach a planet called Kip Ferry. Kip Ferry is not the home planet of the feeders. The home planet of the feeders is further away and it is composed of black ore and ice, whereas Kip Ferry is more of a green planet. They are merely making a pit stop here to gather some food, stock up their ship, and then head on. George and Betty are going to stay in the larger spaceship in orbit, while Heath and Keith are going to break away in their smaller ship. They are going to head down to the planet's surface, grab some food, and then head back up and join the others and get going. So Heath and Keith, they land on the planet surface, and they begin exploring. As they are walking, they are lugging a gigantic hose behind them that leads to their spaceship. They're actually going to use this hose to, like, suck up food, and it will be sent back to the ship. As Heath and Keith are walking around, they discuss the awkward pairing up of the two of them on this mission. 
since Keith is now married to Heath's ex-wife, Charlotte. Keith tells Keith, to be frank, I'm surprised you chose this mission. Keith explains that it was Charlotte's idea that the two of them would go on this mission together. She figured it would be a chance for the two of them to become friends. Keith to this says, <laughs> such a diplomat. The two of them, they climb a little cliff face as their rocket packs do not work in this planet's atmosphere. As they get to the top, Keith tells Heath, for what it's worth, I tried my damnedest to convince her what you did to the Dressites had to be done. It seems like Charlotte told her new husband all about Keith's little genocide he did on the Dressite planet. On top of that cliff, they find some wild vegetation, big trees, big flowers. They also find some sort of bush with a whole bunch of melons on it. These melons are the food they are going to want to collect. Keith tells Keith, you want to be my pal? Take that hose and suck up those melons for me, chum. Meanwhile, Keith, he goes on and looks for some fruit to eat. He starts picking it off the trees and eating it. Keith, he is using that hose to suck up some melons off that bush. He is sending them to the ship to allow food for their journey. As Keith is doing that, though, a ginormous flower plant monster thing attacks Keith and swallows him up. Eventually, Keith, after eating some fruit, returns and he notices that Keith is gone. Keith looks around for him and he starts cutting through various monster plants, assuming maybe one of them swallowed him. Eventually, a ferocious Kip Fairy alien, native to this planet with four arms, flying on what looks like a giant goldfish except in the sky. The Kip Fairy jumps off from up high and surprises Heath knocking him out with a giant club swing. All of a sudden, their routine trip down to this planet to gather food that should not have taken this long has taken a dangerous turn. When Heath eventually wakes up, he realizes that he is tied in some rope and dangling from under one of those giant flying goldfish things. Heath, as he is dangling there, flying in the sky, sees that Keith is also tied up and on top of one of the other flying goldfish things being flown by a Kipfarian alien. Keith, he manages to pull off this crazy move to get free. One of the Kipfari flying the goldfish takes a wide turn and Heath dangling from the rope manages to swing over to one of the other goldfish things. Keith kicks off the Kipfarian alien on top of it and also manages to grab that alien's knife. Keith, he then cuts off the rope that he is tied in. So Heath is now free, and he is on top of his own flying goldfish, and now he is steering it. Keith, he's flying that goldfish, and he leaps off of it, and onto another flying goldfish. He wrestles the Kipfarian on top of it, and tosses him off. Keith, he then does another death-defying leap. He jumps off that new goldfish, grabs some vines, and swings over to yet again another flying goldfish. Keith is wrestling the Kipfarian on this goldfish. The alien, though, keeps flying, following their leader that is in another goldfish. They fly into what seems like an underground volcano that has a city inside of it. Keith, he struggles with the Kipfarian on this particular goldfish, but he manages to kick the alien off into the lava below, just barely escaping being singed by the magma himself. Keith, he starts piloting this new goldfish he is on. He is above the goldfish that Keith is strapped to and tied to. Keith, he jumps off his goldfish and kicks off the Kipfarian alien that Keith is on. Keith, he then starts trying to fly him and Keith out of there, but they are now being pursued. And then we see this giant underground city in the lava. Keith and Keith will most likely not be able to escape. Issue 18, Hatchet Job, Chapter 2. Back in Volume 2, the cliffhanger we ended on was that Mara made some sort of deal with the Dressites. She helped them and they ended up going to Earth. What was her motivation for doing this? Well, 
we will now learn. We have a flashback to 10 years ago during the Anubis conflict when Earth was being invaded by the Dracites, the Taldeans, and the Zarin. Mera was just a little girl then in Brooklyn. It was anarchy there, and a man named Levi Diablo showed up to Mera's family home, and he promised to lead them to an evacuation site. He told them helicopters would pick them up and take them somewhere safe. As they were going through Brooklyn trying to get to the site, Mera's brother died. Eventually, Mera and her family were led to a clearing by Levi Diablo. He said that helicopters would be there soon, but the helicopters never came. Instead, a Zarin teleportation portal opened, and some Zarin popped out and picked up Mera, her whole family, and a whole bunch of other people. The Zarin took Mera and her family to some place to be caged, where they would perhaps be eaten. Levi Diablo, he was not there to help Mera. He was a bad guy. He was rounding up humans for the Zarin for profit. He was being paid in unicredits. The Zarin paid Levi for rounding everyone up. As Mera and her family realized they were now prisoners and that Levi Diablo sold them out, they cursed at him. And Levi, as he was leaving, he told them, Look on the bright side. While the Tataldian Empire annihilates every soul on your planet, you'll be grazing on Zorania for months before they finally... Uh, it's not important what they're gonna do. Look, I'm sorry for your planet's bad luck, friend, but you can't blame a guy for making a quick buck off the inevitable. Little Mera and her family spent the next few years in a Zarin cattle pen, and she saw both her parents eventually get slaughtered, and Mera vowed that she would get revenge on this Levi Diablo for selling them out and bringing them here. She dreamt of wiping that smug look off of his face. So this is why Mara now sold out to the Dressites. She gave them what they wanted and in exchange, they told her the location of this Levi Diablo, who is a space pirate. Mara she then used that information to lie to Charlotte and the others. She convinced them to travel to this specific part of the galaxy, where Levi Diablo will supposedly be. And she has put Charlotte and her ship of passengers on a collision course with this space pirate. Mera, she does feel a little bit guilty about lying and selling out the Earth to the Dressites, but she figured... The Dressites would have gotten to Earth anyway, with or without her help. Some other mess of a human would have given them what they wanted. At least now she has the location of the man that ruined her life. Back to the present now, to Team 2. Mera through her lies has now led everyone on a path to Levi Diablo and his space pirates. The space pirate Levi Diablo, now in range, opens up a communication video to Charlotte's ship. Levi Diablo talks to them like a pirate. He says, Prepare to be boarded, me lass. Ah, you heard me. You run afoul of the dread black galleon. Batten to hatches and grab your ankles. I mean to board ye. Charlotte, speaking to Diablo through the video communicator, asks, Y'all intending us harm? You ain't gonna find boarding us a simple task. Levi Diablo, he just laughs and he stops talking like a pirate. It was just an act. He tells them, listen, I'm sorry, sister. I was just having a bit of fun with you. You'll have to forgive me. One tends to get a bit loopy after enough time pillaging filthy to tell the freighters in the deep. No harm intended. Levi Diablo is not a good guy, but he sees no reason to battle Charlotte and her crew right now. So right now, everything is calm and diplomatic between both ships. Charlotte explains, I'm frankly shocked to see a human ship out here. We're on a mission to scout the planet below as a potential new home for humanity. Levi, he knows a little bit about this planet and he knows it would not be a good home for humanity. He says, down there? No way you want to go down there. Levi's second in command, Whitebeard, warns Levi as he's seeing some readings coming from Charlotte's ship. Whitebeard says, By the moons of Wilnod, Levi, this treacherous bitch is stalling you. 
their gun ports have been activated and armed. Levi, taking this information in, gets angry. He tells Charlotte, it's been so long since we've seen a human face, we'd planned on leaving you to your hopeless business, but if it's a fight you want, a fight you'll have. Charlotte, she did not want to fight. What the hell is going on? She tells them, no, wait, please, it's just a misunderstanding. See, while all this diplomacy was happening, Mara, she snuck away. She snuck down to the guns in their ship, and she is aiming and fires a big shot at Levi's pirate ship. Remember, for Mara, this is all about revenge. She wants to kill Levi for what he did to her family. Charlotte, now learning from her crew that Mara is responsible for firing on Levi and for this act of war, she grows furious. The pirate ship, being hit with this fire, opens up their cannons and fires back. The pirate ship is superior and very strong. Charlotte's ship does not stand a chance, something Mara did not think about when she started this whole mess. Charlotte's ship gets hit with retaliation fire from the pirate ship, and it does massive damage. The ship now is going down. Charlotte and her crew have to prepare for a crash landing on the planet down below. Charlotte, she is screaming now. Everyone into crash positions. Send an emergency distress call. We're going down. Back on the pirate ship where everything is calm because they are easily winning this fight, Whitebeard tells Levi, the Earth ship is going down. No challenge at all. Levi questions to attack in such a half-hearted fashion with an inferior ship. Strange behavior from those purporting to be the last bastion of humanity. Mara, she is now a failure in her mission to avenge this Levi Diablo guy, and she has to rejoin the others on the bridge of the ship and get into a crash position. She sits down and straps on her seatbelt. Charlotte, seeing Mara, tells Scott to keep a gun trained on that bitch, referring to Mara. Charlotte asks Nicholas if he can get them stabilized. Nicholas says he can't, not without power to the rockets. Someone else there tells Mara, Thank you, Mara. You killed us all. Charlotte tells Scott, Scott, if this crash doesn't kill that woman, you shoot her. Mara, saddened by her failure and now dooming the entire crew of the ship here, says, He won't need to shoot me. None of us are surviving this. Their spaceship violently crashes into the planet below. It first hits a building and it breaks in half. One half of the spaceship gets stuck in that building. The other half of the ship lands and crashes into the ocean and the planet below. In the water, Mara, she gets free of her seatbelt and she tries to swim to save others in the ship. She manages to save Scott and Rita, but the others in the ship drown and die. Meanwhile, Charlotte and Nicholas are still alive themselves. They are stuck in the other half of that ship that is stuck in this building. Nicholas, he grabs a rocket pack and grabs Charlotte and flies the both of them down to the surface below. While this crash landing is going on on planet Nievasivia, over on Kip Ferry, Keith and Keith have their own struggles. They have been captured by the Kip Ferian aliens. It looks like they did not escape on those flying goldfish. They are being held prisoner now, and they are being marched through the streets of this lava city. Keith, he's pretty calm about all this, though. He points out to Keith, <laughs> Look at that dude, he's riding a lava turtle! Keith is angry, but Keith, he's laid back. This is routine to him. Keith tells Keith, Hey, little son, you act like you've never been taken captive by a barbaric alien race before. Keith and Keith are brought in front of the Kipfarian leader here. He is named General Clat. Keith and Keith have translation chips installed so they can understand this general clearly. The general believes that Heath and Keith are spies from Earth, and he does not like Earthlings. He does not like, also, the way that their sister spaceship is hovering in the planet's atmosphere. Therefore, he wishes to send one of these Earthlings back as a warning to not mess with his planet. He tells them, 
You have brought all this misfortune upon yourselves. And as I need only one of you alive to carry my warning back to Earth, you will battle each other to the death for my amusement. And if you do not, your friends will be blown from the sky. The general then says to his men, take them to the arena and make sure to broadcast the duel to all the quadrants of the galaxy. All will know the fate of those that trespass against the Kipfer. As Heath and Keith are sent to the arena, the Tataldian Gentu appears behind a curtain. Gentu tells the General Platt, You have made a great ally this day, General. The Tataldian Empire knows how to repay a friend. General Platt says, Eternal life is all I desire, Lord Gentu. All right, everyone, bear with me because I now have to describe the battle between Heath and Keith, which Heath and Keith sound so similar, so I will do my best to try and make it clear who I am referring to when I refer to one of them. In the arena, Keith and Keith have to prepare to battle each other to the death. Keith, he's picking out what weapon he will use. Keith tells him, what are you doing? You're not actually going to go through with this, are you? Keith says, I don't have much of a choice. Keith in anger argues, bullshit. You're all too happy to go through with this because you want me out of the picture. Keith takes offense to this. He calls Heath an arrogant, shit-kicking redneck. He tells him, you took yourself out of the picture when you abandoned Earth ten years ago. Make no mistake, Houston, this isn't personal. Only reason I'm going to kill you is to save my fear agents. Something you also failed at. Keith believes that Keith is purposely trying to rile him up. Keith almost wants Heath to kill him and survive. In the arena, they enter. It is packed with aliens watching as well as flying video cameras broadcasting across the galaxy. The two of them start fighting, swinging their old school gladiator type weapons. Keith he swings and stumbles down to the ground. And Keith tells Heath as he sends him to the dirt, Get up, Rummy! Is that all you got? Keith, he thinks to himself, This guy, he's trying to get me mad enough to kill him! Even when he's a jerk, he's got some selfless goddamn motivation to it! Keith tells Keith, Damn it, man! Why are you so quick to accept this Shakespearean brawl to the death? We could get out of here! Keith explains, No, they can't. There's too much at risk to chance anything else. Keith, he rushes at Heath and tackles him to the ground. Keith then has a knife to Heath's throat. Heath says, Come on, then. You took the rest of my life. Finish the job. Keith then backs up. He tells Heath, It wasn't like that. I did what I had to do. Charlotte thought you were dead. You abandoned her. She'd just given birth, and Eden needed a father. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Keith. He just learned that he has a daughter named Eden? Keith continues, Charlotte didn't trust you to know. It's why I came down here with you to tell you. You got a daughter, Houston. Keith asks, why is he just learning about this now? Keith answers, when you got to Earth, you were a drunken mess. Charlotte wanted to wait to give you a chance to get your life back together. I was glad you were such a wreck. I knew you showing up would cost me my family. I'm not stupid. I always knew Charlotte never stopped loving you. I didn't want your life, Houston. I just wanted her to love me as much as she does you. But I always knew I was a placeholder. You gotta get back to her. Put all this mess right. Keep them safe. It is your life, Heath. But you gotta live up to it. In the course of their battle in these big revelations on Heath's life, Keith grabs the end of the spear that Keith was holding, and Keith pulls the spear closer to himself, and he drives the spear into his own body. To the crowd out there in the stands, it looks like Keith purposely killed him, but really, Keith was the one that pulled it towards himself. Keith, now dying with a spear in his belly, says to Heath, Tell them both how much I love them. <sighs> Keith then dies. Issue 19, Patchet Job, Chapter 3. In prison in the borderlands near Dressen, 
Thomas York is being held prisoner. We saw the Dressites manipulating Thomas in Volume 1, making him talk to Heath and making him trick Heath, sending him on a mission to the infested feeder truck stop. Well, Thomas York is still alive, but he is being held captive by the Dressites. While Thomas York is being kept here, he gets visited by Andy, Otto's niece. Last we saw, Andy was in Volume 3, which took place 10 years ago during the Anubis conflict. Andy, she got sent through a Zarin portal on the moon and was stranded on the Dressite homeworld instead of being sent to Earth. And on the Dressin homeworld, she saw Heath Houston pop out of a Zarin portal later and set the bomb that would poison and kill and wipe out almost the entire Dressite species, basically committing a genocide on them. Keith, he then went through that portal back to Earth, and Andy, she was left behind, and it was assumed that she died in the explosion there. Well, she actually lived. All the Dressites on Dressin died, but she survived. Most of the galaxy assumed that the Tataldians were responsible for the devastation on Dressin, but when the Dressite troops that were off-world returned home from the war, they found out that everyone on their planet was dead. Everyone was gone, except Andy. She was alive. And they tortured her. They held her responsible for the slaughter of their planet. But eventually, she convinced them of the truth. That Heath Houston was responsible for the genocide of their people. Somehow, over those years, Andy had some sort of operations done on her or something, and she was turned into a half-dressite, half-human. She also has her own containment suit, filled with that weird dressite liquid. Andy. She is bitter about being abandoned on Dressin, and perhaps a little brainwashed. She has now allied herself fully with the dressites. She in many ways now considers herself a dressite too. She talks to Thomas York, saying, Tisk tisk, they forgot all about you, didn't they? They left you to rot. Has anyone taken the time to let you know what's become of your homeworld, Thomas York? We've annihilated it completely. Thomas York says, Bullshit. More of your slug mind games. Andy replies, No, no games. Payback for humanity's war crimes. We know, Thomas. We know what your people did. The soldiers returning from Earth found a woman amid the trillions of dead on Dressin. Naturally, they held her responsible for the slaughter. They tortured her, tore her to pieces. You cannot imagine the suffering she endured. When born to evil, enlightenment is an arduous journey. But she saw the truth. I saw the truth. Keith Houston sent to murder billions of innocents, with me conveniently left behind to pay for their blood. I know that deep in your heart, you'd love to help me make Keith Houston suffer. I know you won't let me down. Over to the planet Kip Fairy. Keith Houston, now having won the gladiator combat against Keith, has been brought back to his spaceship called the Alamo, and he is allowed to leave. He is supposed to pass on the warning to Earth. One of the Kip Fairy tells him, Warn your race of disposed imperialist to stay clear of Kipfer. Keith he gets into his ship and takes off. He communicates to the sister ship he is traveling with, the Eagle, where Betty, George, and the others are on board. Keith he breaks the news to them that Keith died. He says, Yeah, listen, things got ugly down there. Natives thought we were scouts looking to lay claim. Keith's dead. Don't go telling Charlotte. Well, tell her myself. Betty informs Heath that they picked up a distress call from Charlotte's ship. It went down and they crashed three hours ago. Over on Nevisivia, Mara, Rita, and Scott have managed to swim to land. They are exploring. Rita is very angry with Mara and blames her for the deaths of their colleagues, one of them which was her boyfriend. As they are walking, they come across what looks like a whole bunch of dead bodies, which does creep them out a little bit. 
they head inside an abandoned looking building which appears to be some sort of old temple. Inside, they start a small fire for warmth. And also while inside, they start hearing some movement. They are then face to face with three soul-eating ghouls. These ghouls used to be the Nevisivians, the alien race native to this planet. But now they are just ghouls feeding on souls. The ghouls grab at Rita. They place their hands on Rita's head and they devour her soul, draining her life force. Mara and Scott try to fight them off with some fire, but eventually they just start running away. And as they are running through the building, Scott asks Mara, What are those things? Why the hell did you bring us to this godforsaken planet? Mara explains, I had no idea what was down here. I only knew that this was the world those pirates orbited as their home base. Scott asks, Why would you knowingly put your team and all of humanity at risk just to attack some space pirates? Mara explains that she couldn't just let him get away. He killed so many, killed her family, he had to die. Scott says that they could have helped her. Mara explains that the Dressites, they wanted a system pass to Earth to kill someone. A war criminal, they told me. She is referring to Heath when she says this. Mara explains, I didn't know about the feeders until it was too late. It was all a setup, my meeting Heath. I, I tried to warn the United States, but the Dressites sabotaged Annie and, and the Dressites, they, you know, they liberated me from Zarin and I trusted them. Scott, he comforts her a bit, but he tells her, Listen, I don't know what you expect me to say to you right now. You've clearly made some awful goddamn decisions, but get it together. We'll deal with this later, but right now, we have to keep moving, okay? At that moment, Charlotte and Nicholas find Scott and Mara. The two of them traveled down here to the surface and eventually found the others. Charlotte still does not forgive Mara and punches her in the face. And as they are all fighting and arguing, a hologram device turns on. It detects that the language they are all speaking is English, and it relays a message to them, translating it to English. The hologram says, Greetings, off-worlders. You have accessed the planet-wide artificial intelligence. No services are available at this time. Our time is ended. Charlotte asks the hologram, what wiped out everyone on this planet? The hologram then explains. We were refugees fleeing religious prosecution. We fled to this planet 500,000 years ago. We thrived here, became very technologically advanced. Normally, when societies become so technologically advanced, they cast aside religion, but not us, the Nevisavians. Our religious fervor only grew. On one of our most holy days, our chief scientists and priests discovered the secret magnificence of a black hole and thought them to be glorious gateways to heaven, traversable only by souls. Our priests and scientists discovered a means to open a black hole to take all souls at once in glorious ascension. However, in order to facilitate this mass ascension as one people, our population would have to perish simultaneously. The high leaders gave the order to develop the technology to set this in motion. For their own good, this decree was never revealed to the general population. As the preparations advanced, dissenting voices within the church were silenced. To speak against the planning of the mass ascension was grand heresy. After a time, none who questioned the plan remained. It was our destiny to return to God in unison. Once completed, the high priest slash president initiated stage one. Our cities were blanketed in a lethal sonic blast. The black hole was activated, sending many people's souls into the black hole, into heaven. But when the black hole closed, some souls returned rejected by God. And to this day, the singularity remains unstable, indiscriminately reappearing. It rips these damned souls from their hosts, returning them when again it fades, and the rejected live again. So to translate that, basically they are a weird religious cult and they committed a mass suicide being sucked into a black hole. It's possible there was some legitimacy to their crazy religion, and maybe they did actually all go to heaven, but 
Whatever happened, some of those souls were rejected and were sent back to the planet below. There they lived on as ghouls, trying to capture more souls. Scott, understanding the hologram, starts freaking out. He tells them, those things, those dead bodies, they're not all dead. Mara chimes in that they ate Rita's soul, and now they're coming for us. A whole bunch of soul-eating ghouls then enter the room. They are repeating the name Kalinor, 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 which I think is maybe the name of their weird god, I don't know. The group of them try to run. One of the ghouls grabs onto Scott and starts sucking his soul. Mera kicks the ghoul off of Scott. Scott, he is still alive, but is greatly weakened. Mera and Scott make their way into a control room. In that control room, Mera gets on a computer. She's trying to find some sort of escape pod that will get them off planet, and she manages to find the location of one. It is on the roof of this building. Scott, while he is looking around, sees some sort of communication device. He investigates it and figures out it is some sort of time communicator using the black hole and it can send a message back in time. Scott and Mara think they can maybe use this to warn themselves not to come here. Mara, she registers a message to Annie's communicator to send back in time. Scott, he sets up the message to send, and then he dies. Having his soul being sucked earlier only gave him so much more time to be alive. Mara, she records the message. The message that she sends back in time is the one we saw Heath receiving back in Volume 2. The message is, Heath, Heath, are you there? Scott's dead. Jesus, they're all dead. If you hear this, please get me off this planet. This place is a death trap. If you come here, do not land. Dear God, they're almost inside. It's too late. Get back, you soulless son of a bitch. Heath, I love you. While all this is happening, Nicholas and Charlotte, they got separated from Scott and Mara, and they are fighting through some ghouls on their own. And they read on a computer about the escape pod that Mara found that is located on the top of the building. It is on the roof. Nicholas, he tells Charlotte he is going to stay behind and fight off the ghouls to give her time to escape. He says he's going to buy her time and to go. Charlotte, she starts heading up the stairs to get to the escape pod. Now Mara, she already made her way to the roof and she is already in the escape pod there. She has perhaps been there for a few minutes. She has already waited a bit. She wanted to wait more to give Charlotte and Nicholas more time to get there as well so they could all leave together. But Mara, she feels like she can wait no longer. She says, God forgive me. And she closes the door and she takes off in the escape pod and it blasts away. And Charlotte, she arrives on the roof just in time to see Mara leave. Charlotte, she screams, wait, wait. It seems like Charlotte is going to be a goner as well. Luckily though, Charlotte gets saved by Heath, who came to rescue them, responding to their distress call. Heath, he drops down from a rope right in the middle of the temple roof, smashing through some stained glass windows. He starts blasting away at the ghouls. He tosses a gun to Charlotte and tells her to shut up and shoot. Charlotte says that they're surrounded. They'll never make it through all of them. Heath replies, Hell, sugar. Figured you'd known me long enough to know at least one thing. I always catch my break. Issue 20. Hatchet Job. Chapter 4. We see a flashback to Mara living under Zarin captivity seven years ago. Her and her dad were kept in cages with others like livestock to be taken away to be eaten. Mara's mother had already been taken and was killed. Mara, she is in that cage and she is eating some food and Mara's dad told her to try not to eat so much. They always take the healthiest ones first, only eat enough to survive. One day, the Zarin came by and they tried to pull Mara out of that cage, but Mara's dad kicked them back, was trying to defend his daughter. The Zarin decided to take him instead. Mara's dad tried to keep the Zarin attention on himself rather than the attention returned to his daughter. That Zarin then bit off Mara's dad's face, killing him, 
and Mira, she got blood splattered all over her. At that exact moment, the Dressites arrived. And remember, the Dressites were a perhaps good peacekeeping force back then before Heath committed a genocide on their homeworld. So the Dressites arrived as peacekeepers. They killed the Zarin and they freed the human prisoners. One Dressite opened Mara's cage and told her, You're safe, human girl. Come, we will return you to your home, to your family. Mara points to her dead dad on the ground, brutally mauled to death, and she says, That's all that's left of my family. The Dressite, sympathetic, replied, Poor creature. Avert your eyes, child. Take some comfort. I know it seems impossible now, but one day you will have your revenge on those who put you here. Perhaps we can assist. Back to the present day. Mera left the planet Nevisivia on an escape pod, and she managed to covertly travel up to Levi Diablo's pirate ship and sneak aboard. Mera, she is now sneaking aboard the pirate ship, trying to find Levi Diablo. On the planet's surface of Nevisivia, Keith and Charlotte, after battling through some of the ghouls, managed to get saved by Heath's ship, the Alamo, arriving. The Alamo was being piloted by Annie, the ship's AI. Annie dropped a ladder for them to climb up. Keith and Charlotte climb the ladder and both get back aboard the ship. On the ship, Charlotte tells Heath all about Mara and how Mara is responsible for killing her entire team. Charlotte says, that bitch lured us here in order to kill the man she blames for the death of her family. The man in that pirate ship. That's where she went. We can't let her get away with this. Heath tells Charlotte that he will deal with Mara. Heath also breaks the news to her that Charlotte's new husband, Keith, is dead. Heath explains, we, uh, we got ambushed and held prisoner and, uh, he died protecting his fear agents. He saved my life. Keith he wasn't fully being truthful with Charlotte when he told her how Keith died. He didn't tell her anything about the whole battling to the death thing in a gladiator arena. He figured that Charlotte probably couldn't handle the full truth right now. Charlotte, she cries, and the two of them hold each other. Keith, he then asks about his daughter, Eden, and if what Keith told him about her is true. Charlotte tells Heath that Keith could never keep a secret. You understand why I couldn't tell you after Kent, after everything you did during the war? I just wanted Eden to have a clean slate. Charlotte shows Heath a picture of his daughter, Eden. Heath, he tears up a bit. They talk about her some more. Heath then talks about the Dressites and what he did, committing that genocide on their homeworld. Heath explains, You remember all those crazy theories that George kept spouting? When we were locked up in that bunker after the attacks, he kept saying the Dressites were dueling the Tataldians for ownership of Earth, using the United Systems as a front for their planet grabs. That boy was a yellow snake, but I think he was right. They weren't accidentally killing humans during the invasion. They were going to wipe us out and blame it on the Tataldians. After their EMP blast finished off the Tataldians, they came and started killing our people. They killed Otto. If I hadn't done what I did, they'd have killed us all and taken Earth. Now, maybe Heath is right, or maybe he is just trying to excuse his genocide. It is hard to tell what would have happened if Heath didn't kill them all. Eventually, Annie tells them that she has found the pirate ship. Heath tells Charlotte that he will deal with Mara. He goes to sneak up aboard the ship. On the pirate ship, Mara, she is sneaking around. She overhears Whitebeard, who is Levi Diablo's number two, talking to a Dressite Andy. Andy tells Whitebeard, There is a man in your region with a sizable bounty on his head. His name is Heath Houston. He's the human architect of the genocide on Dressin. It is believed he and his female accomplice will seek you out. The woman has business with Levi. It is a delicate job, and as such, the Dressite Empire is prepared to offer 7 billion unicredits for his apprehension, alive and unharmed. Mara, overhearing all of this, now knows that Heath is responsible for killing all of the Dressite on their home planet. Mara holds a knife to Whitebeard's throat and makes him shut off the communication screen to Andy. 
She asks Whitebeard where Levi is. Whitebeard tries to sneakily fire on Mara with the tiny gun he has hidden on him. Mara, she dodges back and is forced to blow Whitebeard's brains out. Mara, she starts crying. She didn't mean to kill him. She's not a killer. This isn't what she wanted. She says she's so sorry. Levi Diablo then sneaks up behind her and tells her, You can tell him in person. He fires on Mara with a gun. Mara evades it. She flips around and she fires on Levi Diablo, hitting him in the arm, forcing Diablo to drop his gun. Mara then stands up. She's now pointing her gun to Levi's head, and she tells him, You couldn't keep your mouth shut then, either. I was young, you won't remember me, but you'll remember my father. You sold us to the Zarin. I watched as they tore him apart in front of me. Levi, unmoved by this, replies, Sure, sure, I remember. Boo-hoo! Your people's time had come, girl. If I hadn't sold you to the Zarin, you'd have died in the hands of the Tateldians or the Dressites. Same as your brother on Earth. You're only standing here alive because of what I did, sister. That's a fact. Mara tells Levi that she is going to enjoy torturing him slowly and then killing him. That is when Heath arrives. Heath, he snuck aboard the ship, found Mara, and now he is pointing a gun on her. He tells her, you can torture him, draw it out for a day or two, but once it's over, you gotta face the rest of your days dealing with what you've done. Mara replies, well, then I better enjoy it then. The two of them argue. Heath says that after all she's done, she doesn't deserve to enjoy breathing. Mara argues that Heath has no idea what she has been through and that the Dressites used her. Heath tells her, you killed this man and you create a hundred new enemies in his kin and his relations. You kill him, how many of his return payment on humanity? The chain of blood ends here. Drop that goddamn pistol, Mara. So Heath, he doesn't want Mara to become the cold-blooded killer. Mara then replies, listen to you, the grand hypocrite. How many Dressites did you kill? A few trillion? Heath is shocked. How did Mara find out his secret? Mara continues, you want to know the difference between us, you sociopathic John Wayne? Your genocide was deliberate. Tell me, when you saw your chance to return all that agony festering inside you onto the monsters that put it there, how many people died for your revenge? They used me, Heath, the Dressites, but it was my gigantic goddamn mistake, and yes, one that I should be killed for. So if you're gonna kill me, then kill me. Just spare me your hypocritical sermon. You've got your revenge, Heath. Some compensation for your family. You've got to at least feel some sense of satisfaction from the mess you caused. I won't be talked down from this, so you've got two options. You either let me have my revenge or you kill me. Heath tells her, You know I ain't gonna kill you, darling. As they get deeper into this heated argument, Heath and Mara aren't watching Levi Diablo that closely. Levi manages to grab the pistol on the floor that he dropped earlier. He points it at Mara and then he fires right through her chest and Mara, she dies. Levi Diablo stands up and tells Heath, That was a really pretty speech about revenge, friend. Exposed how right the gal was and how hollow your principles really are. Have your revenge. Go ahead. Shoot me. Heath, as he is contemplating it, he gets hit in the head by one of Levi's pirate accomplices. And then they throw Heath out the airlock into space. It is sort of like the space pirate version of making someone walk the plank. So Heath, now being tossed into space, is floating out there. He thinks about how with no oxygen he'll be dead in under a minute. He also thinks about how he saw Levi grabbing that gun, and he didn't do anything to stop him. He kind of just let him kill Mara. Issue 21, Hatchet Job, Chapter 5 on Earth's moon, Dressite Andy shows up to Humanity's base there. She visits her Uncle Otto's grave. She says to it, Uncle Otto, rest easy. He's going to bleed for what he did to us. Andy then heads inside the base up there. We see Eden Houston, Charlotte and Heath's daughter. Andy, as she walks in, she stands in front of a whole bunch of fear agents and she comments, Nice outfits. I used to have one just like it. Eden Houston, just like her dad, is ready to fight. 
she pulls out a gun that her new dad, Keith, gave her. Eden warns Andy, you get away or I'll put a hole through your head. Andy, she is confident though. She twists at her arm and seems to remove it. Andy, with her hand removed, starts spraying the fear agents with the liquid inside of her suit, and it is burning and killing them, and she manages to decapitate one of the fear agents as well. Andy, she is planning on taking Eden Houston back with her to the Dressite homeworld. Eden threatened to put a hole through Andy's head. Andy replies to that, ah, that famous Houston charm. We'll see if it holds out during your amalgamation on Dressin. We jump over to Heath Houston floating above planet Nevsivia, waiting to die. And as he is out there floating, something very odd happens. A jelly brain appears to Heath out there in space. It says to him, your echo has interjected itself into the closing war. Heath Houston, the Chronodome is in danger. You hold the destiny of the cosmos in your hands. When all bow to an illogical and chaotic current, only one who has been mirrored by the displaced holds the power to successfully contest its flow. He is hidden in a shadow, a step out of time. You, the anomaly, hold the power to stand against this stream. The futures are not yet written. When trapped in a hole where no direction leads out, this will guide the way. The Jelly Brain then gives Heath some sort of black box device. The Jelly Brain ends by saying, Once out of time, allow no reflection. The Jelly Brain then disappears, and Charlotte in a spaceship picks up Heath. What does all this stuff the Jelly Brain told Heath mean? I have no idea. We will find out in the future. Heath and Charlotte are now in the spaceship together. Annie the AI warns them that there is an unnatural black hole opening over Nevisivia. She needs them to get out of here immediately. Annie, she begins flying them over to the sister ship to dock with them. On along the way, Charlotte and Heath are talking about what happened to Mara. Charlotte asks if Heath loved Mara, and Heath answers, I reckon I loved things about her. As they are talking elsewhere, we jump to the Tataldian homeworld. Gentoo has returned home from his travels to Kipferia. One of Gentoo's loyal servants named Thels greets him. Gentoo gets escorted to a room where we see the timekeepers are there to meet him. Gentoo asks them, Greetings, my counsel. Your visit is unexpected. Have you news? The judge, whom we recognize as one of the timekeeper judges that sentenced Houston, says to Gentoo, under the nose of our fellow keepers, we have tenuously maintained this timeline where the Tataldian Empire still exists and even thrives. After the anomalies meddling, this is no small undertaking. However, your manipulations of the displaced have yielded a splendid result. A jelly brain in attendance states, the anomaly will make the Prime's location known to us. The players have been set precisely on the board. You will see the return of your glorious god, Tetald, provided you do not forget your end of the bargain. Once again, this interaction brings with it a whole bunch of more questions. They mention Heath being an anomaly, leading to the Prime's location. We also get hints about potentially some sort of deal between both of their groups. All of these new lingering questions will be given convoluted answers in the next two volumes. Keith and Charlotte, they dock with the other fear agents, and they are all together. George tells Charlotte, once they are all on the same ship, that we'd contacted the Kip Ferry to begin negotiations for the return of Keith's body, and they were broadcasting this. We see on some video screens. It is the broadcast of the battle between Heath and Keith in the arena, and we see Keith seemingly looking like he is stabbing Keith to death. Keith tells Charlotte, it ain't what it looks like. They forced us to fight. They were going to blow up our other ship in the sky. Keith threw himself on my spear. Charlotte is furious. This isn't the story that Heath told her earlier. Heath explains, I figured you might need some time before you could absorb the particulars, but you think I'm capable of this? Charlotte yells back, I know damn well what you're capable of. 
Keith, he storms off angry. He leaves this sister ship, the Eagle, and returns to his ship, the Alamo, with Annie. In the Alamo, a video message comes in from planet Nevasivia. It is Nicholas, the Russian fear agent. He stayed behind to fend off the ghouls to buy Charlotte more time to escape. Well, he is still alive and fighting, and he asks for evacuation if possible. Annie advises against going back for him. A black hole is growing near the planet, but Heath, he decides to go anyway. On planet Nevasivia, Nicholas is fighting off the ghouls, but he is getting outnumbered. And just when it looks like he is going to get killed, Heath arrives in the Alamo and drops a ladder for Nicholas, and Nicholas climbs it and joins Heath. Heath, as he is letting Nicholas onto the ship, says, I recall you tagging me as a coward when we first met. Figured you owe me an apology. Nicholas replies, Da, you are, as they say, my hero, Heath Houston. As Heath and Nicholas are back on the ship, they prepare to jump out of there before the black hole will encompass them. Annie tells them, though, it is too late. The black hole is fully materialized. Remember, this is the same black hole that the Nevasevians' souls get sucked into or whatever the hell they do. Annie says, the opposing force will tear us apart. Heath tells Annie to then launch them directly into the Singularity. Annie thinks that is crazy. Heath orders, the moment we hit the Singularity, reverse direction and jump to warp. The momentum should ricochet us away. Now, this is where some weird shit happens I can't fully explain. As they are traveling to this Singularity, this black hole, the Nevasevian souls seem to be coming along for the ride. Annie tells Heath, I'm sorry Heath, too much time has passed. We've been in this black hole for six years. By the time you hear this, another six will have passed. Heath and Nicholas are aging. They're looking very old. They're still traveling through this hole. Heath is now really old. He seems decrepit. He is crawling on the ground of his spaceship. The weird ghost of Nevasivia, the ghouls, they're trying to devour Heath's soul. Heath, he's crawling. He touches this weird black box that the jelly brain out there in space gave him. And we fade to white. That is the end of Volume 4. What does this all mean? Where are we going to go in Volume 5? What is on the other side of this black hole? We will find out in the future. Alright, so that was Fear Agent Volume 4. Let me go through my thoughts on this one. I really enjoyed the Heath and Keith subplot in here. And their adventure down to this planet to just pick up some food. And then they get captured by these aliens on flying goldfish. And then they are forced to battle to the death in this arena. And the conversation between Heath and Keith is pretty compelling. Keith tells Heath about his daughter Eden, which is a big revelation. And then Keith sacrifices himself and makes Heath kill him in that uh, gladiator battle. So really entertaining, fantastic stuff there. Uh, the pirate subplot with Mera I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, seeing some of Mera's history in the Anubis conflict and how terrible her life was. And how this Levi Diablo pirate guy sort of screwed her over and gave her to the Zarin. And uh, yeah, and then that storyline kind of ended with the death of Mera by that pirate guy, and then Heath sort of calling her out, and them arguing. So, uh, that was pretty interesting stuff. I mean, maybe not the most satisfying resolution there, but uh, definitely some big uh, plot points happen in there. So, pretty entertaining stuff. Now, we had Andy, Andy Dressite. Andy, who's a minor character in Volume 3. Well, we see that she has been made into a Dressite, and is now working for the Dressite Empire. Her character design is really cool. I love the look of her. And now she's kind of a bad guy character for the future. So uh, pretty interesting stuff there. Now the whole Nevisevian subplot with this weird planet where these aliens are ghosts and they're ghouls and they're trying to capture souls and whatnot. Uh, that was a little bit crazy for me. Did not really love all the plot points there. But we did have that pretty cool cliffhanger where uh, Heath and Nicholas get sucked into this black hole, and it looks like they're aging. And uh, next volume, we will see where they get spit out. So very entertaining stuff. So I thought this volume was still very entertaining and compelling. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and tune in next week where we will see where Heath and Nicholas went to.